morning, church family. Welcome to Worship from Afar. Rob and Carol Fraser here coming to you from our home in Nashville. I'm going to lead you this morning in some songs of worship. There's an old joke among musicians when someone hasn't really given their best. Some of the other folks will say, well, they just phoned it in. But today we're going to phone it in, but we're going to give it our best as well to bring you out before the presence of the Lord and allow you to sing your praise to Him from the comfort of your own home. So here we go. Today is Palm Sunday, although we don't think, we're not thinking along those terms today. It is Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, the beginning of Holy Week just before His crucifixion and resurrection. And of course, as we all know, what they sang along the way was Hosanna. Hosanna to the King of Kings. Hosanna in the highest. Let's sing that together. Baptist, but it's a song I'm very familiar with. It's a song inspired by the words given by Samuel to the people of God as they faced battle. And he said, do not fear. He said, the battle is not yours, but it belongs to the Lord. And I sure think that applies to the way we need to be thinking and have the opportunity we have to be thinking about our circumstances today. The battle does belong to him. He fights our battles for us. The armor will enter the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. The weapon that's fashioned against us will stand, the battle belongs to the Lord. Lord. 
and hard do not fear The battle belongs to the Lord Take courage my friend Your redemption is dear
this morning that it's a song we've done before several times at First Baptist, but it really sums up much of the biblical truth that Brad's been bringing us in his sermon series, God's End Game. It's a, a song inspired by Revelation chapter 5, where John, the Apostle John looks prophetically into the future and sees Jesus about to assume his eternal throne, uh, given to him by his Father, uh, and he receives his throne because he is worthy to receive all honor and glory and power by virtue of his sacrifice on the cross, his obedience to God the Father, all on our behalf. And uh, so we're going to sing, Is He Worthy? It's got a lot of relevant uh, material in it, but there's one line especially that sums up particularly well uh, God's end game, what he intends to do with we, his redeemed people, through uh, over time. And if you get that uh, insight, when the song comes up, as we're singing, quickly go ahead and uh, enter that in Facebook, if you're following along on Facebook. Here's the line, and uh, it'll be fun to see how many people get it and how soon. Let's sing together, Is He Worthy? <laughs> Oh, 
week in your heart. And we'll see you soon. Thanks for worshiping with us. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, in our online audience this Sunday morning, uh, Palm Sunday. We are really glad you're here. If you're a guest uh, joining us today, we would love to know. Uh, and if we can be part of your faith journey, we would love to help. And you can uh, tell us about that uh, by filling out the online guest card. Uh, the uh, link is below. We would love to hear from you. Well, you may notice that things look a little bit different this Sunday compared to the other Sundays that we have been broadcasting our services via Facebook and YouTube. Um, we've been pre-recording at church on Saturday mornings uh, and then premiering uh, on Sunday. But with the governor's stay-at-home executive order uh, issued on Thursday, we decided it was best to stay at home for now. We want to set a good example. We want to be safe. We want our community to be safe. So that is what we're doing for now. And so Rob came to you from his little home studio in 12th South uh, in Nashville, and I'm coming to you from my dining room in our little house on Highway 41A in Pleasant View. So uh, welcome to our church and welcome to my home this morning. You know, if my message seems or feels a little wooden today, it's because I have never preached from a table before, let alone my dining room table. I feel kind of lost without my lectern. It's kind of a, a safety net for me, so this is uh, uncomfortable, but hopefully uh, we'll get through this together. You pray for me uh, as, as I pray for you. And you know, as much as I hate not being together face-to-face, -face, uh, face -to -face, uh, one cool thing about doing church this way is that you can show up in your jammies and nobody will know. In fact, if you're watching in your jammies uh, right now this Sunday morning, tell us about that in the comments. Something else, too, you know, if you're drinking your coffee right now, like I am, uh, I, this is actually my third one of these today. If you're drinking your coffee right now, post a pic of your coffee uh, in the comments. You know how I feel about coffee. And if you're one of those people who's not drinking coffee because you don't like it, well, why don't you just put your hand on the screen right now, and I'm going to pray for your healing and for your deliverance this morning. <laughs> well, seriously, you all are in my prayers as well as the prayers of our staff and our leaders. By God's grace, we will get through this tough time together. And if we can help you in any way with that, please don't hesitate to let us know. You know, one last thing before we pray and get into the message this morning. At the end of the sermon today, we will premiere a brand new song written and performed by our own Steve and Annie Chapman. You do not want to miss that, so hang around to the end for that premiere of uh, their new song. Well, let's pray together, and we'll get started today. Well, Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus, and thank you for this Palm Sunday. And this is the Sunday that you rode into Jerusalem on the donkey like the king that you are. And uh, we thank you, Father God, that you are our king, our heavenly king. And, and one day you're going to set up your earthly kingdom on this earth. Uh, so today we come uh, to you uh, this morning asking your blessing on our time together. I pray you'll bless this word. I pray you'll get me out of the way. Father, I pray that, that your spirit will overcome all of the, the things that could get in the way today and how we're having to do this differently. And uh, I just pray that your spirit would minister your word to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, I've been preaching this series that I've been in for so long, I, I kind of hate to close it out. But as they say, all good things must come to an end. Many of you have, have been so kind and shared with me how what God has shown us from his word about his end game, about how he's going to set all things back to rights, how that has blessed and encouraged you. And I really appreciate that. And, and to be honest, it has blessed and encouraged me too, uh, especially, especially right now with everything that's going on. When you step back and you look at the big picture of God's all-reaching, history-sweeping, extravagant redemption plan, a plan including all creation and not just people, you realize more than ever God is in control and nothing Absolutely nothing, not even a pandemic, happens apart from his providential will. You realize he really is working all things together for good, moving us ever forward and ever closer uh, to the day he turns to his son and says, it's time. And he sets into motion events that close out this present age and begin a new age in a new heaven and a new earth. Now, for many, the virus outbreak that's ravaging the world right now and toppling economies is just another reason not to believe in God. 
How could a good God allow that? How could a good God allow so much suffering and pain in the world? And, and you know, that's an honest question. One the Western church has been dodging for far too long. Those who choose not to believe in God because of pandemics and such are saying the world ought to be a place where no one has to hurt or suffer or get sick or die. The world ought to be a place where bad things do not happen. And I'm going to tell you, they're 100% right. It ought to be a place like that. I've got a question for you, though. Where would we get the idea that the world ought to be a place free from pain and suffering? If there is no God, and there never has been, and we all are just the byproducts of some random mingling of proteins in a pond eons ago, and the whole of our existence has always been chance, chaos, and survival of the fittest, then where would we get the idea of a world free from pain and pestilence? That should have never even entered our minds. You know, C.S. Lewis was once an avowed atheist. He talks about, after becoming a Christian, how this very quandary influenced his coming to Christ. Let me quote from him in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, If a good God made the world, why has it gone wrong? For many years, I simply refused to listen to the Christian answers to this question because I kept on feeling whatever you say and however clever your arguments are, isn't it much simpler and easier to say that the world was not made by any intelligent power? Aren't all your arguments simply a complicated attempt to avoid the obvious? But then that threw me back into another difficulty. My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust, but how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? If the whole show was bad and senseless from A to Z, so to speak, why did I, who was supposed to be part of the show, find myself in such violent reaction against it? Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that it did not happen to please my fancies. Thus, in the very act of trying to prove that God did not exist, in other words, that the whole of reality was senseless, I found I was forced to assume that one part of reality, namely my idea of justice or a good world, free from these things, was full of sense. Consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. If the whole universe has no meaning, we should have never found out that it has no meaning. Just as if there were no light in the universe and therefore no creatures with eyes, we should never know it was dark. Dark would be a word without meaning. Folks, the pandemic is not evidence against the existence of God or that he is uh, angry with us and casting down judgment. It's just another reminder of what happened in the garden way back in the beginning. And the beginning is where we started in this series over a year ago. Genesis 1.1 In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know that God lovingly made all there is, including us. It's our origin story. It tells us why we're here and where we came from. And in the beginning, everything was good. Genesis 131, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. In the beginning, the world was exactly the way we all, even the atheists, long for it to be. But things did not stay that way. In God's good world, there was just one rule, and Adam and Eve broke it, plunging the universe into darkness, death, and sin. What happened in the garden explains why things are the way they are right now, why there are such things as viruses, why God needed an in-game plan. All of history, all the Bible is a record of God's in-game plan for setting things back to rights, for restoring our relationship with him, a relationship that was severed when sin came into the world. Now, if you remember, as we went through this series, we discovered that plan, that in-game plan, revolves around a person, and his name is Jesus. And it has three telescoping parts, one flowing from the other. It begins with the incarnation. We learned there that Jesus is God with us in the flesh, both 100% God and 100% man at the same time. And I was honest with you back then, and I'm honest with you now. I don't know how that works. I just know that's what the Bible teaches us about Jesus. 
Now, this is incredible, the incarnation. The author of all there is wrote himself into his own book in order to save us. That's what the Apostle John introduced uh, his gospel with in John 1, 1 through 4, 14, 16 through 18. In the beginning, John writes, was the Word Jesus, and the Word Jesus was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. But Jesus has made him known or explained him to us. Jesus came as God in the flesh in the incarnation with a mission and a plan. Uh, the Apostle John wrote also in one of his letters, 1 John 4, 14, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his son Jesus to be the savior of the world. And then also in his letter, the same letter in chapter three, verse five, you know that Jesus appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. Jesus came in the incarnation. God came to us in the flesh in the incarnation to undo what Adam did. Where Adam failed, plunging us all into sin and death, Jesus succeeded, making the way for us all to be made right with God. Jesus lived the life Adam and we all should have lived, but didn't. Now, God's in-game plan revolving around Jesus begins with the incarnation and it climaxes with the crucifixion. You see, Jesus also did something else along with living the life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died. He gave himself as payment for our sins on a Roman cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Uh, 1 Peter 2.24, Peter writes, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And then Peter also wrote uh, in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And you know, traditionally, we Western Christians have majored on the crucifixion. We camp out there. And that's what we've written the most songs about. That's what we frame the Christian life with. It's all about the cross for us and how it allows for the forgiveness of sins. It opens up the doors of heaven. We might even sum up God's plan this way or even the gospel this way. We would say Jesus died on the cross so that we could go to heaven when we die. And there's nothing wrong with that idea. That certainly is a part of God's endgame plan. But when you look at the bigger picture of God's endgame plan, you realize the crucifixion, as cosmically as important as it was, was more so the means by which God could bring on the next phase in setting all things back to rights. The phase which would set everything in motion towards the end. God's endgame plan for rescuing the world carries on through Jesus' resurrection. The early Christians were all about the resurrection because it was the link, the bridge between their future forever heavenly home and the here and now. Heaven wasn't about when the role is called up yonder one day. It was about heaven invading the right now, the present. The kingdom of God has already come in a sense. And if you remember, a theology book helped us uh, frame the importance of the resurrection. Uh, in this theology book, it defines the resurrection this way. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is that central moment in human history that serves as the foundational doctrine of Christianity. After having truly assumed human nature and submitted to an agonizing and shameful public death, incarnation, crucifixion, the eternal Son of God was truly raised from the dead, resurrection, in his glorified physical body, no longer subject to decay and death. His resurrection validates his identity as the divine Son of God, demonstrates his irrevocable victory over death and the grave, and secures both the present salvation and future physical resurrection of believers. Now, let's look real quickly back at that first part. The resurrection of Jesus is that central moment in human history that serves as the foundational doctrine of Christianity. 
The resurrection is the hinge on which all of Christianity swings. That's why Easter is what it's really all about. That's why Easter is where it's at. That's why Easter is way more important than we ever, than we ever thought it was. All of Christianity hinges on Easter Sunday and whether or not Jesus really rose from the dead. Paul the Apostle knew this, and he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now I'll go back and look at the last part of that theology statement with me. Jesus' resurrection secures the present salvation and future physical resurrection of believers. You see the bridge, the link? Look at the last part of what Paul said about Jesus' resurrection, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus' resurrection as the first fruits of the resurrection, is a foretaste of the resurrection of all believers, which happens when he returns at the end of the age. That is when God's endgame plays out. That's when the devil, sin, and death are vanquished. That's when we and all creation with us is redeemed and a new world, a new heaven and earth, is established. And it is a physical place just as in the beginning. That's one of the incredible things we've learned about uh, where all this is headed. Uh, Jesus was raised in a physical body. We know that without any shadow of a doubt. That means our bodies will be physical when they are resurrected because Jesus is the first fruits of that. And you, you raise a body into a physical body to live in a physical place. And of course, the Bible talks about our forever future heavenly home, not as a place of clouds or harps, but a new heaven sky, stars, and such, and earth, a place made of dirt and stone with trees and rivers and such. Now, this new world is free from sin and death and pain and suffering forever, just like it was in the beginning. And the glorious crown of the new earth, according to God's word in the book of Revelation, is a city called New Jerusalem, where God himself will dwell with us all his children and in that day with God's new Jerusalem coming down and setting itself up on the earth heaven and earth become one just like it was in the beginning and Jesus the Lamb of God will be there Revelation 21 1 through 5 a verse we have covered many 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 times in the last few weeks as we've closed out this series John writes about what he saw in his visions he writes then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. You just have to stop and pause and think about that for a moment. It means more to me than it ever has. The older I get, the more I look forward to it, the more I realize just how important it is. You know, Christians throughout the centuries have not only weathered the storms of life, but have raced into them to help the suffering because they know they have a city. 
we can look as Christians beyond all the uncertainty right now because even if the, the wars and rumors of wars, the pestilences and the pandemics, the earthquakes and the volcanoes are a sign that the end is near, well, that just means our city that we are destined for is just around the bend. And that, brothers and sisters, is God's end game plan. I didn't do it justice, but I did the best I could. They do say all good things must come to an end, and that's true in this world, but that is not so in the next. There won't be a saying in the new heaven and the new earth. In the new heaven and new earth, we will live in the light of God's glory forever. And I've asked this question a lot, and I'm going to ask it again because it's so important. Friend, will you be there? Yeah, I'm going to be there not because I'm a pastor, not because I'm good, not because I do well at keeping God's commands, because I'm going to be just truthful with you. I'm not. I'm going to be there because I put my faith and trust in Jesus. I let his righteousness become my righteousness. His life lived perfectly before God uh, was put into my account when I came to God through him. And not only that, my sins are forgiven as well. And not only that, I'm promised that on that day I will be part of the resurrection and then part of the new heaven and the new earth. And you know, you can be a part of that too. It's not that you try to get good enough to earn it or receive it. That's against the whole point. Uh, you receive it by faith. The Word of God says, Jesus says, Paul, quoting the Old Testament, said, all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And you can do that right now as I pray. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and thank you for the glorious truths about your end game plan. Thank you that for uh, us Christians, your children, we have such a hope, a hope, Father, that fills us um, with joy even in times of hardness. And Lord, I just pray that everybody in the sound of my voice this morning that are in their homes, wherever they are, watching this online, I pray, oh Lord, that if they've never called upon you, they do it right now and they would let us know. I pray, Father, for those of us who do know you, I pray that these truths would encourage us. God, I pray every time things get tough, especially as I know they're going to probably get tougher right now, we would remember we have a city. And in that city and in that world, things like this will never happen. We will never have to worry or be afraid again. We love you, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Good morning, church family, friends. We wish we were together, but we know that'll happen pretty soon. But uh, we wanted to share a song with you this morning. Yeah, I was listening to Pastor Brad uh, on the 53rd uh, segment of the uh, series, the, the end game. And he said something that uh, uh, really uh, caught my ear. And uh, I had to go back and listen to it on the podcast on the church website. and. Uh, it was, again, uh, inspiring to know that we have a city, a place where we're going, and knowing that it makes us different. So inspired by that thought, uh, put these words to music. i 
Savior there who washed away our sins. He's the hope that keeps us looking up ahead. And we have a city we are going to where our burdens will be gone. We believe it's true. With eyes of faith we see the gates that someday Jasper, streets of gold.